is again like a database class a collection of two or last items that I want to cover before we head into next week. Next week we start looking at quite an interesting different uh, movement in post control. So today's class is really just wrapping up some of the topics in the earlier chapters of the textbook so we can get uh, the last three weeks of this course, so we've covered nine weeks of basically uh, basic post control. The last three weeks that are coming up are looking at some more complex, interesting topics. I just wanted to come back to this topic here in assignment four, where you were considering the effect of feedback control, and the main issue that you faced in assignment four, remember, was that you had your process with a time delay. So there's my time delay sitting over there. If we look at this process, it's k equals to minus theta s, the time is plus 1. And what we're looking at, this is a simple proportional controller, and you vary that time delay. So if we recall, let's start with the basic, um, the basic case where this is a time delay of 1 unit of time. When you simulate that, you've got pretty good control. So let's take a look. This is in the solution, so you, you have had a chance to take a look at it. The yellow curve there represents the error signal in the feedback control diagram. The blue curve represents the control curve. That's the variable we're making a set point change. And we can see that we make that set point change and we get to our set point. The purple variable is the manipulated curve. And because this is a proportional controller, the purple line and the yellow line is just simply a scaled version of each other. You can see times that error in yellow gets you your manipulated variable in. And with one unit of time delay, we're okay here. Now, take a look at what happens. Keeping the controller tuning fixed, we go to two units of time delay. We start to get quite a bit of oscillation in the process occurring. And as I explained in the solutions to that tutorial, time delay <coughs> is limiting you, your ability to control the process. So the manipulated variable action takes place, but it doesn't... It, it, input into the process, but there's a delay in getting the feedback. Okay? So the best way you might think of this is if you were riding your bicycle, imagine what you saw on your eyes was what happened in reality five seconds ago. That's time delay. That's not a great thing to be doing, right? You're driving a car, you're riding a bike. Imagine the signal coming into your eyes is what happened in reality a period of time in the past. That's exactly what time delay. So you can see why feedback control suffers with longer and longer time delays. In fact, you start to over control and under control the processes we see in this simulation, so that gets us our oscillations. And if we increase that time delay to five units now, um, we basically set up pretty much a steady oscillation. We're over-controlling, under-controlling, <coughs> over-controlling, under-controlling, because the signal we're getting back from our process is delayed by so much. In fact, if we go to any longer time delays, let's go to eight units of time delay, and you simulate that, you've actually created an unstable process. Now, your control variable in blue, the first oscillation peaks at one and a half, the second oscillation peaks almost at two, and it just gets worse and worse on the So you've taken a perfectly stable system, this ties into the one we look at Wednesday. This first order controller, sorry, this first order process, by itself, if I put in a bounded input, I get a bounded output. So this system is stable. You've taken a perfectly stable system and you've created an unstable overall process. So the overall process from the set point to the control variable now is overall unstable because of that time delay. What do you have to do to get the system stable now? What can you change? Let's say my system actually has a <coughs> time delay. You did this in the midterm yesterday. What do you change? There's only one thing you can change. You can't change the process. Change the controller. Which way? That's a 
aggressive, which way? The zone, so Casey, it's only a proportional controller. Which way, up or down? Down. down. Okay, so time delay, what we get for this is time delay, I have to drop this down to be less aggressive, and now my system is back to stable again. Okay, so Kc has to be decreased, you have to take less aggressive control in order to account for that time delay. Time delay is one of those things that no engineer ever wants in their process. For the same reason when you're riding a bicycle, you could probably get away with getting a delayed visual feedback of one second. Right? You'd probably be able to ride your bike through the city and not get into any pedestrians or buildings if you had one second of time delay. Change that to five seconds, 10 seconds of time delay, 30 seconds of time delay. The more time delay there is in the process, the more unstable you're going to be. And you're going to come into some serious issues. So, in the handout that you have in front of you, that's exactly the issue that's discussed there on the very first slide. This dead time, time delay, it's about eight units. That period of time, you're a sitting duck. You can absolutely not do anything. Any change coming into the process does not register. You don't see anything changing. In fact, there's no feedback control in the world that can counteract that. That red piece under that curve, that integral absolute error, you can never get lower than that integral absolute error. Because you simply don't have the control variable signal coming back into your feedback controller to eliminate that. So time delay is always one thing that we look at on the process to try and eliminate or reduce as much as possible. By the way, is this a PI controller, or a P controller, or a PID controller? Hmm. Take a look at that. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on to the next topic I want to, to cover here. This week you've discovered in the tutorial on Friday and Monday that I've been lying to you for nine weeks. Okay, I haven't been telling you the truth about manipulated variables. I haven't been telling you the truth about sensors and signals in a process. I've also been lying to you about how feedback control is implemented. All the stuff we've learned is actually never used. So why have we wasted nine weeks? Well, let's take a look. What I have taught you is that feedback control is continuous. You've always used the fact that my process control, this manipulated variable as a function of time, is equal to Kc times an error, plus say Kc over Ti. <coughs> and I'll just use a PI controller as an example. That's a continuous variable. It says as long as error is coming in, I'm seeing some sort of manipulated variable change. Let's take a look. This is probably the most primitive form of feedback control that exists in every toilet in the world. If you go open your toilet at home, you will see this sort of device. This is a proportional controller. What we're trying to do is we're trying to fill the tank to a certain height, and that's what the float is there to tell you when you reach that height that's your set point. So the float is your set point where you'd like it to be. And sorry, you'd like your float to get to the set point, so some some height. As this tank is empty, this float will move up and down. And as it moves up and down, this float adjusts the flow rate into the tank. When that float gets to the desired tank, this floats, closes the feed to the tank, and you're, you're done. You fill the tank to the desired height. The tank empties, this tilts back up again, letting the flow of water in. That's a simple proportional controller, and Kc is set by where you put that lever. So if you want more aggressive control, less aggressive control, you simply move that point and that opens and closes the valve more or less in proportion to your error. So there's the world's simplest proportional control. In many chemical processes, we have the same idea. We send a signal to my valve using air pressure from the sensor. So in many old processes, you'll see that you've got your sensor there, and a signal 
is sent to the valve in a simple way to open and close that valve according to the sensor reading over there. Mm -hmm. And we will use pressure in the small tube, I have this tube running in, in my process that is proportional to and maps to that range of temperatures. And that will open and close that steam flow to keep us at set point. Okay, so there's a very crude pneumatic continuous time feedback control. The moment an error occurs, the manipulated variable changes and it changes smoothly and continuously over time. You can also then make that a little bit more reliable. We don't like to have hundreds and hundreds of pipes that carry compressed air around our process. Any operator walking by or a forklift truck driver driving into that is going to break the <coughs> feedback controller. So we typically replace that with electrical signals. And you will see in many processes you have entire conduits carrying racks and racks of electric wiring all over the place. And we typically use the range between 4 and 20 milliamps. And we map that 4 to 20 milliamps to the range of sensor readings we apply. So again here, rather than send compressed air around the process, we're sending electrical signals. And the electrical signals can go much, much further. Pressure signals were obviously limited by elbows and we get pressure losses. So every bend you have in this wiring, or this piping I should say, you get a pressure loss and a pressure loss here actually has a problem. If you have a pressure loss in this pipe, in other words, you're sending the wrong signal. Electrical signals don't get degraded by, by that. So and electrical signals can go hundreds and hundreds of kilometers without degradation. So we prefer electrical signals. And that guy over there, that TC, sitting over here, this temperature controller that's controlling the valve, we can get PID controllers, digital forms of PID controllers built as an electronic circuit. This exists as a printed circuit board that you can purchase, or used to be able to, you probably won't be able to get this much anymore. And with a sequence of resistors and diodes, you can create a PID controller. You can also do this with pneumatics, okay? So here's the, a drawing that describes how pneumatic air pressure can be routed through a set of bellows to create the proportional mode, the integral mode, and the derivative mode. So we don't see this much anymore. But if you go work on an old process, you may actually encounter something like this. What we've gone and done is we've taken these and we've put them into computer software. And this is why I've been lying to you because computer software does not work in continuous time. Digital computer software, digital controllers, works on a discrete sample basis. So let's go take a look at how actual processes, any new plant that you walk into since the 1960s and onwards, will have a digital local area <coughs> where this sensor signal is transmitted over the digital network to some sort of bus on the clock. So that bus is a, a sequence of wiring and conduit that carries all the signals. In fact, many processes will have a dedicated parallel network just for their equipment. Okay, so if you walk into any company that does things right, the entire Ethernet network in the company will be duplicated just to run the equipment. The equipment always runs on its own independent network. So that when someone sits at their desk and starts to stream a YouTube video and eats up all the bandwidth, then your process doesn't suffer. Right? You want your electrical signals to get through on your plant despite any other traffic on that network. So companies that do things right will always have a parallel network dedicated for all the instrumentation so all the sensors sending the signal to the um, from the instrument goes onto the network, and any signals that get sent to the valves get carried on that same independent local area network or LAN. Okay. So very, very important that you'll see this in your career. Well, there's all of this takes place, and the central place where a lot of this lands up is the control room. So you see this picture, a single person or two or three people sitting in a bunch of computers.
computer terminals, and they pretty much have full control of the process. The recent trends are that this is duplicated hundreds of kilometers away. So many companies will have their local control room, but they may even have a remote control room. So many small consumer companies up north in Ontario and Quebec and BC, they'll have a remote control room where they can pretty much start and stop any part of the process remotely. Petrochemical plants can start and stop oil rig, machinery and equipment remotely. Okay. So this control room, this wiring, although it's drawn here, there may be a satellite connection in between here, there may be, it may not be a physical single piece of wire. The key is that we've gone entirely digital in our new processes. So pretty much anything from the 60s and 70s onwards is, is digitized. Now, when we're dealing with digital signals, we have to pay a little bit more attention. A continuous signal has some properties, obviously, it's, it's continuous, and <coughs> you'll always see this example of a sinusoid. So here's an example of a sinusoid, but a digital process does not have this smooth continuity. A digital process has a device that samples that signal. So it's simply a device that opens, closes, opens, closes, and reads that signal, what we say, in a discrete manner. So for example, it will read equally spaced parts of that signal over time. And then you can visually reconstruct what that signal is. <coughs> so each one of these periods is delta t units apart. So we call delta t is my sample time. And you have the choice to set that as the engineer or the electrical uh, people in the, the plant would have pre decided the sample time. Now, take a look, however, if you choose a sampling time that's too slow. Let's say you choose a sample time that's maybe six times what's shown here. So you measure this sample, one, two, three, four, five, six, then that sample, one, two, three, four, five, six, then that sample. The signal that you've got and reconstructed from that is a straight line. Okay. So sampling something too slowly is going to mislead you. Sampling something too fast is never a problem but you're simply just overdoing things. So you can always sample fast, and that's fine. But if you sample too slowly, you can mislead yourself. Here's an example of another case exactly like shown here. Here's my continuous signal oscillating very rapidly. If I sample too slowly, you can actually sample at these points shown by the spikes, and then you might think that you've got a sinusoid that's going at this rate this much, much slower frequency, whereas the reality is the sinusoid that's operating at this very high frequency. So you can pick your sampling point, your sampling time. If chosen poorly, you will lead yourself to believe that certain signals exist which don't really exist in practice. So if you sample too slowly, you may estimate a straight line. If I sampled a little bit faster, I may, in fact, estimate a sinusoid of a different frequency than actually shown over there. And there's a mathematical theorem that was proved in the 1960s. If you take electrical engineering courses, it's called Shannon's Theorem or Shannon's Law. And Shannon's Law tells us that in order to reconstruct a signal accurately, you have to sample at twice the rate of the frequency you wish to detect. In other words, here's my sinusoid going at this frequency over here. As shown, there's a peak over here and a peak over there. The minimum sampling period I have to choose is half of that. So in other words, the minimum sampling I have to do is at that triangle, that triangle, and that triangle, and so forth. That would reconstruct a signal that looks triangular, and so that I'm mostly getting my information across. Any sampling slower than those blue triangles would lead me to get an inaccurate rep representation 
or an inaccurate reconstruction of what that original signal was. Okay, so always have to sample at least twice as fast as the frequency that you wish to capture. That's a, a phenomenally important law that was discovered in the 1960s and led in time to one of the developments in our telecommunications network. So we're, we've got a sample at the sampling time and aliasing then is this effect where you're lying to yourself. By sampling too slowly, you're going to basically tell yourself that you've got the wrong signal over there. So aliasing is that problem. We so we, our rule of thumb is, it's not a very helpful rule, but you need to sample fast enough. If you sample too fast, so if you take delta t arbitrarily fast, all you're doing is you're going to create more work for your computer systems. So too high a delta t, you won't keep up. Now, it is true that most chemical plants can be controlled on the equivalent computing power as is in most of your cell phones. That's fine, but bear in mind that on a computing, on a chemical plant, we need reliability. And so what we'll typically do is we'll distribute the workload over multiple computers. So we still want to sample fast enough, but not so fast that we overload our PCs in our chemical plants but not slow enough that we have this aliasing issue. Okay, so the selection of delta T is, is an important problem about your computer. Now let's take a look at another thing that delta T does. Delta T, we are sampling our signal. And so here in red, on this continuous line, I have my original signal. That's the truth. That's my continuous signal. So I sample over here. And then two and a half seconds later, I start to over there. So I'm reading that value on the curve, I'm reading that value on the curve. Then I sample at five seconds at that peak. Two and a half seconds later, I sampling at this point, this point, this point. So we get the staircase function actually developing. Remember, so I'm simply taking discrete samples, and what we'll tend to do is we'll staircase this along. And that staircasing is called a zero order hold. In other words, it says the computer system is going to read this value and assume that that signal stays <coughs> at that value for the duration of delta t. Then delta t time is then I'm going to read a new value and I'm going to assume that my system was flat on that line for the remain for the rest of that delta t. Then I read a new value until I get to there be a new value and we get the state as function. Squint your eyes and take a look at that staircase function. What do you notice about it compared to the original signal? Okay, it, it's almost like we've taken that signal <coughs> and delayed it. So by sampling, you've actually introduced a time delay into your process. There isn't a real time delay in the signal, but the act of us taking the discrete samples has visually, in the, in the computer system, introduced a time delay for us. Okay. And the longer delta t is, the worse that time delay. That the more offset to the right, the greater that shift to the right is going to be for larger delta t. So sample really quickly, and that shift will almost not be noticeable. Sample really slowly, and that shift moves more and more to the right. So in fact, going digital has introduced a delay. And if you go right back to the start of this course, I said the worst thing we want to do as engineers is ever introduce a delay into our process. Okay, so what we've learned from this is digital control will actually cause a problem for us. It introduces a delay. So there's another reason why we have to select delta t really carefully. It's so that we don't introduce delays that are detrimental to us. So in fact, what we say is we introduce a bound department of delta t time delay is induced into the process due to sampling. 
Now, I will also just add at this point, all the stuff we're covering in today's class is what 4E3 is all about. 4E3, the digital control elective that's next year that you can take with Dr. Schwartz, is all about digital control systems. So we're going into a lot more detail about digital control and the problems that digital controllers have. So this is just giving you an idea of what we'll be covering in that type of course. Okay, so let me kind of preempt what Dr. Schwartz will teach you next year and show you the PID controller in digital form. Why in digital form? Well, let's go back to this diagram that we've, that we've used so far in this course too many times. We have my set point, there's my comparator, we calculate my error E, and that goes into some controller, which I'm just going to call GC. That creates my manipulated variable that goes into my process. And then here's my CV. I bring that back, and there's my set. So we've seen this many times. Now, I've been lying to you so much that in fact the only part that I've been telling you that's true up to now is this part. That is the only part in that entire gram, entire diagram, that is in fact continuous, is your process. Everything else in that diagram is entirely digital. Okay. So we measure my control variable, and actually what sits here is my sampler. My sampler is a thing that looks like this, and it opens and closes at unit delta t. So every delta t, we shut that, a signal gets sent, and then we open it up. Okay, so that's my sampling over there. This controller here, in fact, I called it GC of S up to now. In the digital world, we use Z to represent the Laplace variable in, this, in the digital domain. We call it the Z domain. That's entirely digital. And the signal coming in from the set point is digital as well. So the only thing that's continuous in this diagram is in fact your process. Everything else is discrete. So let's take a look at a digital controller. Well, the easiest way to take a look at it and understand in a very quick few minutes that we have here today is there's my continuous version of it up there, and here's my digital version down here. So you manipulate variable in the control variable. So here sits a valve. Yeah, so your valve, your valve is opening and closing continuously. But this control variable is, you, you're measuring the temperature, but you only take a sample of it every few seconds. So yes, this is continuous, but you don't actually know what this is. Because between the delta t time periods, you have no, no idea what the process is doing. You only know what your process is doing at delta t. In between delta t, you have no idea what's going on. That's why aliasing is so important, the topic of aliasing. So let's take a look at a digital version of the controller. Well, there's a one-to-one -one mapping. The proportional term maps exactly the same. Instead of take, measuring E continuously, you just sample E, so in the same way. So we call that E subscript N. So at the end sample, I just help measure what E is. And integral, well, we can use all the stuff that you learned in 3E to estimate an integral. You can just use the simple rectangular approximation. That that integral is the sum from 1 to N of the errors multiplied by delta T. So the width of the rectangle. That's, that's, that approximates an integral. And a derivative can be approximated by the backwards difference formula CV minus CV at the previous time step. So you're comfortable with those terms. Backwards difference formula, rectangular integration to approximate an integral, and that's your digital controller. So we're capable of putting all of this in digital form, and how that's done and the details of that I'll leave to Dr. Schwartz to explain to you next year. But let's take a look at how a digital controller performs then. Okay. So up on the top 
left is my continuous controller. And here is taking exactly the same KC, TI, and TD that we had before. So I don't go change this KC, TI, and TD. In fact, just simply move those same values of those constants down into the digital form. If I go and do that, I control that process with a digital controller with delta T of 5 units. The process is continuous. Right, so that blue line, that's continuous up over there. But your manipulated variable is discrete. Because this controller, GC, sends out only a signal every so often called the manipulated variable. So the manipulated variable is told to shift up to 40 some odd units, then it's told to shift up more, then it's told to shift down, and in between those shifts, it simply maintains the value that it had prior to. So your digital controller for small delta t actually looks quite similar to the continuous controller, which is why I haven't lied to you too bad. So provided you sample fast enough, delta t is small, you will get the results that we've learned about in the past nine years. It's not a big deal. Okay. How it's actually implemented is a little different. Let's take a look at the fact if we move to longer sampling times. Remember, long, longer sample times has this effect of introducing a delay into the process. So in fact, it introduces a delay of roughly 10 divided by 2, so it introduces a delay of about 5 extra units into the process that's not there otherwise. Notice how oscillatory it looks. Okay. That's why I was showing you that tiny delay example at the start of the class this morning from assignment 4. So in assignment 4, you notice that as time delay went up and up, we got more and more oscillatory behavior. We're seeing exactly the same thing here. Increased delta t, that increases this induced time delay. I get increased oscillation. In fact, if you take that delta T up too high, you can go make it, your process unstable. By simply choosing too long a sampling time, you can make your process unstable. Okay? Using the same principle I showed you at the start of the class. So what that means then is when we're going to tune our controllers, so you guys are going to use the CM rules that we learned about the class. <coughs> Basically, you now have to also be aware of what delta t is. You can't go use those rules without taking delta t into account. That's what today's class is about, is to make you realize that in practice, if you go use those rules, you can't just go apply them straight away. You must take that time delay into account. So I'll come back to this slide in a minute, but here's what, here's what I need you to do. If you're tuning your controllers in the future, you get your model using the process reaction curve method, for example. You get your delta t, and I'll talk about why this delta t needs to obey that constraint. And then what you go add is you take your existing daytime in your process, let's say you've got an existing daytime of data units, add to that daytime an additional delta t on the two time units, and then go tune your controller based off those units. And the graphs that we learned about. So that's the only change you need to make, is simply taking into account this additional induced time delay. And then you're done. You still have to go back, and your last step is to do the fine tuning, but you would have done that anyway. Okay? So, so that's the process we follow. What I'd like you to do is work on this one, give this a shot. Here's a process where we're controlling three times in a row, we're controlling the concentration at the outlet by manipulating the flow at the inlet. So what you have is KP, theta, and tau for this existing process. What are the controller tunings for KC, tau, I, and TD using a sampling time of 15 minutes? This is a really long sampling time, 15 minutes. It means you're only taking action once every 15 minutes. So how does KC, TI, and TD change Go ahead and calculate that using the graph of the same function.
so then let's ask this question. Yes. Sorry, going back to the last one, where the value for the PCM is used in storage, right? For the storage is used, yeah. I just choose the PCM. Okay, so then here's the question. If PID controller in the digital form actually will always be worth <coughs> that continuous bit. Okay? Because of this time delay. You're always going to add a time delay on here. Why would we even use digital control? Now, I will just come back to a prior, prior slide that I skipped over. And that was this criteria here that I forgot to talk about. This criteria that says delta T should be less than 5% of theta plus tau. So take theta plus tau, and it says if you've got a delta T that's smaller than that, what the interpretation of this is, then your behavior is as good as a continuous process. So if you meet this criteria, it's as if you were controlling a continuous process. Take a look at what that means. It says that you've got a process and you're taking 5% of the time you lay plus tau, if you're sampling faster than that, you're sampling very rapidly. Remember what tau is telling us. Tau is telling us how fast or how slow the process moves. And theta is simply the delay that gets added on. So if you've got a process that's moving really slowly, you can get away with small, with uh, longer sampling times. If you've got a process that moves really quickly, small tau, you better be sampling much faster than that tau. So processes change rapidly, you have to sample rapidly. Processes are better changing slowly, you sample slowly. Okay. So this rule of thumb says as long as you meet this requirement, it's as if you're choosing a continuous control. What is this requirement for this example we just looked at? <coughs> if you meet this criteria for the example we just covered, what does Remember, theta was my original process time delay. So what's theta? 5.5 plus tau, 10.5, so 16. 5% is 16. 0.8. Our sampling time was 15. So we were way off this, which is why we needed to compensate for that time delay. If, our, if we found a delta T of, say, 0.5 minutes, so rather than 15 minutes, if we had used a delta T of 0.5 minutes, we would have met this criteria, and then we would almost see no difference between continuous and digital control. You don't have to add it. You can add it, but you'll find that KC, uh, tau I, and tau T will be identical. These would barely change. So this is a good rule of thumb to remember, and typically we'll sample in chemical industry at about one third to half a second. <coughs> That's pretty rapid. Most of our processes in the chemical industry move very slowly, so that half second sampling is actually pretty good. Most companies I've, I've been uh, working with, they will sample at about once per second. So let's take a look then, despite the fact that digital control causes a degradation in our performance, we still go ahead and use it. We use it because there's so many other benefits from digital control that, just, that go beyond simply the digital PID controller. This one is interesting. Um, I don't know if I'll have time in the course to talk about it, but I know that Dr. Schwartz definitely talks about it in 4 3 and that's the model predictive controller. The model predictive controller, because it's digital, when we make changes in our process, we can actually tell the process to optimize along a certain path. So instead of making a simple set point change, we may actually find that telling the controller to take a different path may lead to more optimal behavior. <coughs> also, you can imagine, Think how you choose your controller either for disturbances or set point changes. A digital controller knows when it's making a set point change and it knows when it, there's a disturbance happening. So a digital controller could theoretically switch between the controller choosing for disturbance change and a di and set point change. Because if you're making a set point change, 
the PI controller can say, aha, I'm noticing you're making a second change. I'm going to use a different set of tuning for the next few minutes. And then I'll switch back to my disturbance tube. Right? It's got that flexibility. We can create arbitrary complex control systems in the digital form. So we can get much greater improvement by using sophisticated and optimized controllers once we go digital. If you're analog or pneumatic, you cannot do that. If you, have, say if you did have a digital controller, could you have even more time away to make your response? Like, you have to get to the same type of signal across your point like that will take maybe longer than this. So, pressure signals and current signals are pretty much instantaneous. Right, so, a change in pressure along a pipe propagates pretty much with minimal time delay. Electrical signals as well. Okay, the internet we can connect between Europe and North America in, in less than a few milliseconds. So, digital signals travel long distances with almost no time delay. So, we don't get additional. Um, another reason why we will use digital controllers is we get good process monitoring. Uh, maybe one way to look at this is to take a look at a chemical plant. <coughs> From a conceptual level, you've got your plant over here. So here's your plant equipment. Okay. This is your physical reactors, containers, piping. Above that, you have a layer which we call our instruments. <coughs> Okay, my instruments, these connect with my equipment and they send signals backwards and forwards. Okay. If you want to look at this purely from a conceptual basis, you might consider it as that. Above your instruments, you've got your control systems. And your controllers are also sending signals backwards and receiving signals from your instruments. And above your controllers, we have what we call our optimizers <coughs> and our schedulers. So these optimizers and schedulers, you'll learn about in 4G perhaps, they find the best place to operate your process to maximize the economics. So every day the price of gasoline changes, the price of, of products in the marketplace changes. So if we can find new optimums, we can download <coughs> those set points to my controllers. Those controllers then manipulate the instruments and those instruments manipulate my plant. And you're reading back from all of them and this cycle repeats over and over. We can only do that with digital control. There's no way we can do that with analog and analog. So, for at least those reasons, we prefer digital control. So, I'll leave it at that point. Uh, tutorial this afternoon. Yes, there is a tutorial. Yes, it's a collaborative midterm. There's a, going to be a little bit of a difference from last time. So, I'll see you there at the tutorial either today or